All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Second Peter chapter two. Sometimes with the people that are here and those of you that are watching, uh, questions arise that you probably would like answers to. There are no questions that are dumb questions. And uh, I invite you to you know, text or, or call and uh, can see if maybe uh, I had something wrong where there's, you have a question about something else that's in, in conjunction with what we're, we're covering. And, you know, when we do this more offline, then it's easier to ask questions than when it's live stream. But we'll, we'll do with what we can do. Second Peter 2, 1 and 2. But there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So the week before, we looked into the Old Testament uh, for false prophets, wasn't hard to find. There's quite a few of them. And uh, they were saying some of this, the same words that the true prophets were saying. The Lord has said. The Lord said. And, and you know, we, we have a preserved standard. I always marvel at the faith of those in the Old Testament. That they didn't have that. And so you have, you'd have a Jeremiah who would say this, and you'd have many other ones that would say just the opposite and, and call Jeremiah, you know, dangerous and foolish. And so people had to choose which ones they would pick. Most of them picked, sided with the faults. It's interesting. Do you think people are, most people are siding with the faults today as to the truth? Yeah, obviously they are. For some reason, the false is so inviting and so tempting, so desirous and so wrong, but they, it just like they, they don't care. So in the New Testament, we don't, we don't have the prophets after the resurrection. We have teachers. Uh, and we also have, according to what Peter says, false teachers. They are enemies to the church and to the people of God, and the truth of God's word. Now, if you hold your place here and go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, most of us know that only as covering the Lord's Supper, and the end of it is that's true. 1 Corinthians 11, and we'll start here in 17. And this, the application here is directly toward the Lord's Supper. Now in this that I, dec that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So very important passage in conjunction with the Lord's Supper. But there's a, there's a broader application to the truths of God's word and to those doctrinal truths that come from God's word that are, are so important. And so I believe the things that you know, we talk about, we're going to talk about, that we have talked about, are tests upon us to see what it is we believe versus what we say we believe. And then upon some, some disagreement or resistance, then all of a sudden we change our beliefs for whatever reason. Now you could be wrong about something, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about something that you looked, you felt that you were talked correctly, 
and then and eventually somebody comes along and they teach something that's completely different, disagrees with God's word, and then because of their persuasiveness or uh, eloquence or something else, he said, well, yeah, that sounds right. We, I'd like to cite prophecy, but prophecy is it's a hard one to do. In the older days, most of your named preachers were mid-tribulation. I mean, they were solid mid-tribulation. And the pre-tribulation came into to being and, and took over. And then you had the, the post-tribulation and the free wrath people. And, and they, they kind of stayed in the background. But now they are raising, raising up and ridiculing pre-tribulation. So I, if, if you were convinced of the truth that you learned by, then I th wonder why you would change. Uh, I, kn I know, you know, I learned pre-tribulation. I've got verses to back it up. And I know people that were in the same category. And then because, uh, let's take the pre-wrath position and Rosenthal, and he came along and it was so inviting because even though you don't take everything into consideration and having to go through six years of tribulation, that's not very, very tempting to me. And so this, I, don't, I can't deal with that. There, there are other things. I'll get into that. So I want to deal with the characteristics tonight of the uh, false teacher. And the first part of this is their presence. In verse 1 of Second Peter, but there were, were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. All right, First Peter, uh, I mean, verse 1 starts off the chapter with, with an interesting word, but. What does but refer to? It refers to contrast these false teachers with the ending of verse, chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the contrast is between these false teachers and the divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit scriptures. A direct contradiction. The false teachers are not going, they're not going according to the word of God and the preserved word. They're going to something beyond that. Uh, we also know that those who are false make bad prognostications. They're not accurate. Not only are they not accurate, they're, they're false for the most part. So he says there will be fault, there were false there shall be false teachers among you. In Matthew 24, our Lord refers to a time where there will be false prophets at the end time. And as you're dispensationalist, then you know that that's a tribulation period and everything goes back to focusing on the Jewish and the false prophets will be back in, into uh, the, the limelight. Yeah, no mention of false teachers because the church isn't there. So Peter deliberately connects the rise of false teachers with the false prophets in Israel's past. He links them together. So I want to give some of the marks here of false teachers. Uh, I'll read you the verses, but I won't, I won't uh, read them because there's, there's a, well, we're going to, we'll look at one, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, this is the first thing about the false teachers, is that they would, they would come from within. They would come from within the body of believers. Acts chapter 20. Paul speaking to the elders at the church of Ephesus on his way back to Jerusalem. And he begins here where I want to start in verse 26. Wherefore, <clears throat> I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. 
Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one and night, every day, every one, night and day, with, with tears. <clears throat> so there are some without, but there's also some within. And, and so this is a, a listing of within. Uh, number one, they were, they were officially recognized. First Kings 18, 19, uh, and I can give you the other passages. They were numerous, oftentimes the majority. Actually, more than oftentimes, 1 Kings 18, 19, and 22. They had great influence over civil authority. 1 Kings 22, 6. They caused people to forsake the word. 1 Kings 18, 18. That's an interesting one for today. Uh, Hyper-emotionalism prevailed. 1 Kings 18, a lot of this in 1 Kings 18, 26, 28. They are energized by lying spirits, which means that there had to be either her, some kind of harassment or possession. 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23. They laid claim to divine authority. That's what I said before. The Lord said, you know, the Lord told me this. Uh, Jeremiah 14, 14 and 15. They lived, lived immoral lives, Jeremiah 23, 14. They were under God's severe judgment, Jeremiah 23, 31 and 32. They persecuted the true prophets, 1 Kings 18, 4, 22, 6 through 27. I'm sorry, I'm going so quick. They were to be disregarded by God's people Jeremiah 27, 9, 10, and 14. I wish that was obeyed today. And they distort, they distort the word. 2 Corinthians 11, I think verses 3 and 4, or definitely 4, where there's another Christ, another gospel, and another spirit. And they distort what we know as the Holy Spirit with another spirit. The gospel as we know it for another gospel and... and uh, Christ for another Christ. Okay, so there, here's number two. Their work is initiated secretly. It's not above board. There, there is great integrity in keeping everything above board. Uh, we've tried to do that financially with, with the church and everything else we've done. So that nobody has a question, where's the money going? What, what are you doing? Do you know where it is? Do you know what we're doing? You can question that, but at least you know what is, what is happening. We're not sending it to, um, there's a number of places that I can think of, and they're, they're all out the window. It's good that I can't think of them now. In verse, in verse 2, he says, in, uh, or in, in the same, who shall privily bring in damnable heresies. Uh, so th they come in by stealth. Uh, go back to uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And look here in <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2, look at verse 4. And because, that, because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So they, it, it's kind of a continuous thing. They, they work and they try to worm their way in. And the next thing you know, here come the heresies. Uh, Jude verse 4, 
if you want to look at that. Jude verse 4, this is where I get the word the creephood. These are creepers. Jude verse 4. For there are certain men, there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So they initiate destructive heresies. These are not, again, things that don't seem to matter a whole lot where you, you emphasize a minor point and make it a major, or you won't emphasize a major point, you make it a minor. These are serious, and they're destructive. All right, their, their position in, this is number, this is the third thing. The, the second point was their work is initiated secretly. Number three, the, the, there is their position where they bring in damnable heresies. Okay, in the New Testament, that's not, not just an opinion. We all have opinions, but it embraces false conduct as well as a deliberate and willful departure from right thought and practice. It, it's not, it, these are not things that you could consider accidental. These are deliberate. They, they, they have a source, obviously. And once you implant a heresy, they lead to a moral practice, spiritually and, and sometimes even physically. They, these are people that choose to, name, to speak in the name of Christ and at the same time cast aside the doctrine of Christ. And it says that the Lord, in here in, in verse 1, even denying the Lord that bought them. Now, sometimes this causes confusion and say, well, these, this is talking about saved people. Hear, hear me out. In reality, they want nothing to do with the blood of Christ. They want nothing to do with the cross. They want nothing to do with the resurrection. They want nothing to do with his lordship or that salvation is through Christ alone. They don't want anything to do with that. Their denials were, were an established uh, mode of life for them. And how do you know that? Because it's evidenced by their, by their words and their practice. So when it says that they were bought, there's a great truth here. Uh, paying the price for redemption and, and how it's used. Jesus paid the price for redemption through his blood, his death, his burial, his resurrection, even for those who deny him and his salvation. So my neighbor came over yesterday. I was doing some work outside and her husband had to go up to Charlotte and and so he, he, is, he was just leaving. And so we were talking about a, a bunch of things. And eventually, you know, this conversation kind of worked its way into uh, a little bit of my testimony and a little bit of my background and, and the gospel and, and spiritual things. And we came to a place where I said, you do know that Christ paid for all sin. Oh, I know he died for all. That's, that's what she said. I said, do you believe that? I said, she said, yes. I said, well, he came for you, even if you were the only one. He came specifically for you. And, and that he died not just for all, but for you, specifically of her, to her. So I said, your debt of sin is paid in full. Even though you were, where, are wherever you are spiritually and, and don't want a whole lot to do with this. And I just told her I didn't want her to think that just because you believe that Christ came and died on the cross for all people, that that's your ticket to heaven. I said, it goes a little farther than that, that you, that's a good place to start, 
but you need to know it's personal. You need to acknowledge that he came for you because you couldn't save yourself and trust him uh, for, your, for your salvation. Uh, I'd like to say that, you know, she trusted Christ as Savior, but, but uh, this is milestone, it's, it's our conversations to, to build on. And fortunately, she's open to what I have to say. And I really want to see her and then her husband and the kids saved, obviously. So Peter shows us that these ingrates, these reprobates, even though their sin debt was paid, they still deny him in word and deed. So when it says bought, it's talking about Christ. He didn't buy them necessarily. He paid the debt for them. And in paying the debt for them, you know, everybody goes to, Everybody that goes to hell is going to have to go and make a payment for something that they can't pay that it's already paid for because they rejected him and, and, and you know, and die forever. So I think it's a, a wake-up call to me in many circles, even close to us theologically and, and church-wise, the story of redemption by the blood of Christ is being repudiated by many churches and people through their practice. Uh, I was reading a statement of faith uh, about a particular place. Not one reference, not one reference even close to the blood of Christ. And I thought it's interesting, you're getting so many people, but there's no, no reference to his blood, which is so important. How can, you, how can there be forgiveness if there's no blood? Shed. So human in, humanism teaches that uh, man is his own savior. Th that doctrine prevails in much that goes on in churches that fail to recognize the authority of God's word. And then it says in verse one, and bring upon themselves swift destructions. Destruction. So denials of his person, his work, um, his lordship, his redemptive work, and also in chapter three, his promise to return. I mean, these are among the scoffers in chapter three. So I said before that I was gonna to try to isolate a few people, and I hope that you don't know these people, but if you do, then you'll have to check it out. So the first person I want to bring up is a fellow by the name of Joseph Prince. And uh, he's got a big following. And so he was on a particular show and he says, when we preach healing, the devil comes and puts his sign up and says, heretic. And the people oppose, the people, some people, many people oppose their teaching. He says, if we come along and preach prosperity, the devil comes and puts a sign up and says heretic. And people oppose that, these legalists, these many people that, that try to pr prosecute us. Can you, can you believe what he, he was, how he was calling wrong right and calling right wrong? The devil doesn't come and put a, a sign up heretic. The word does. And if, and if you're, you're teaching some of these things that are against the word of God, then you have a right, you have, you not only have a right, you should come against it. All right, if guy by the name of Larry Hutch and Paula White were having a something TV conversation together and suddenly he burst forth in front of her and he said, Jesus, what did he say? Jesus Christ was not the only begotten son. And then he repeated it a little louder and then he started shouting it as she was saying, the first time she says, well, I'm the anointed divine uh, priestess. And I thought, these people are dangerous. These people are really dangerous. Joel Osteen repeatedly denies that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. He had his chance with Larry King years ago, 
blew it. He had his chance with Hannity, blew it. And he's got this persistent uh, fall back where he talks about when he and his dad were in India and all these people in India, the Indians really love God and, and are really good people. Well, what kind of God do the Indians serve in India? Which one of the 10,000? Is it any of them Jesus Christ? No. His wife denies the deity of Christ, saying this, Jesus was a man until God touched him and put his spirit into him. Again, these people are dangerous. Um, two more before uh, I have to go in the back and get duct tape out. We all wrap our heads. I mean, because, you know, this is, I'm just touching the surface here. Um, and these are two people that are uh, alike in this disbelief. There's a guy by the name of Creflo Dollar, and you're familiar with Benny Hinn. They espouse the same teaching, and I'm quoting, as spirit beings who possess the nature of God, we have the ability to speak things into existence, just like God did in Genesis 1, unquote. The things you're going to hear tonight are, are we're going to speak things into existence. Total heresy. And then later on, your little gods, small g, but still gods. That's a popular one among a lot of those. So, listen, in the midst of where we are with the virus and all this craziness, the devil is still capitalizing on the gullibility and naive religious people and, and sometimes even Christians. So listen to this, and I'm quoting. We have always controlled the weather, unquote. Gloria Copeland said that about her husband, Ken, when wherever they live, there was a tornado coming and he rebuked the tornado and the tornado went timidly back up into the sky. Now this is the same guy that said that he prayed now and killed the virus. It's dead. And then a week and a half later, prayed that a heat wave would be brought to New York to kill the virus that was already dead. Their false doctrine is always inconsistent. Let, let, when you go to court, the judge usually should let the person keep talking because if he's, if he's in, the, in the wrong, eventually he's gonna convict himself. That's what false doctrine is. So go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. The one thing that, that I want to take away, one, one of the things that I want to take away from all of this is, is really our, our great need to be in the word continually, to know what the word says, and then stand for the truth continually. Because anything less than that gives the devil and his crowd a victory. So 1 Peter 3.15, I was in Bible college, this is the first verse I ever learned. It's in Christian ethics, seven o'clock in the morning. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You cannot do it if you don't get in the word. I mean, you can start with a testimony of what happened to you when you got saved, but beyond that, you're going to have to start learning and seeing what God has to say in here. And so you, you need to be ready. And how can you be ready if you don't know? And too many of us have been satisfied of not being ready and thinking, well, I don't have the answer to that. I've had to say I don't have the answer to that, but I'll get back to you. And I have gotten back to, to people. Uh, the other passage here is in chapter 2, in verse 9. It speaks to who we are. 
But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, speaking of Israel, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Where did we come from? We came from the darkness. I don't care what age we were saved, we were in darkness. And when we got saved, we were called out of that darkness into his marvelous light. And we are to show the praises of him that has saved us. And we can't, again, we can't do that if we're not, if the word does not become of, of who we are. Uh, some people can make a transition from home life to church and it's not the same. Others of us come, come to church and it's just a part, an extension of who we are. There's a big difference. And, and over time, you can tell that uh, because these, these are things, I depend on these things. The things that, that I find, I depend on the things that I hear from people that are teaching. I try to take those things in and put them to use in, in, in my life because they, they weigh heavily on who we're supposed to be. If I ever get to a place what I, where I don't become teachable, then I'm of no use. And I'll be a detriment to, to people. So we have to be a people that, that know where we are, where other people are, and how to combat that. It, it's, it's important. You and I can't be selective in who we talk to. We shouldn't be. Some people don't like to talk to adults. Some people don't like to talk to children. Some people don't like to talk to educated people. Some people don't like to talk to uneducated people. Do you see any of that in scripture? But going into the educated world, that not it's go into the world and preach the gospel to who? Everybody, if you get the, the opportunity. Where, where this goes, uh, on, on the live stream and on the internet is beyond me. But look what's, what's happened periodically when people contact us and we knew, we knew nothing about people watching or listening to any of that. That's, the, the Lord can do that. And if we're afraid of who this is gonna reach, uh, then we're, you know what we'll do ultimately? We're, com we're coming to some subject matter that uh, in all likelihood we won't want to touch because maybe the live stream carrier, if it was Facebook or Google or even YouTube, will say this is, this is not proper content. This is insensitive. Uh, I just read of a case where I think it's a Baptist preacher in Idaho preached, used Google and they took it off, said this incense that we can't preach it. You're preaching about death. You can't preach about that. If you talk about the virus, you gotta talk about death, don't you? So they just use that as a platform to just uh, kick them off. I know of a guy that's been kicked off Facebook at least a hundred times because of what he puts on there, which is, the truth. I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, but you can't be afraid of that because then we won't do anything. So we're going to close a little early. I don't want to go into the next um, phase, number three, because it, it would go too long. So uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Those of us that hang around here, if you have any questions, we can uh, hammer them out. If you have something you want to send or, or call about, we welcome it. We pray that you, you have a good night and that uh, the Lord will watch over the ones that are sick and the ones that uh, would be here if they could. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for speaking to our hearts. I hope that you did. It's horrible that we have to talk about people that are... Uh, so adverse to the truth of your word, so sure that we are so wrong. 
and we just fall back on the truth of your words. Uh, everything, everything rises and falls on, on that truth. And we don't need any further revelation. We have it all. So we pray you speak to our hearts. Give us a good night's rest, uh, a good rest of the week, and taking advantage of any opportunities that you might present before us. And let's pray for Sunday, what we do here, and for the people that might be here, uh, for your will in their lives. Uh, may they all know that those that have been coming regularly are sorely missed and definitely loved. And so we pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen.